Hey everybody, welcome to The Sit Down, I'm DJ Sixsmith, hanging out with Rick Gonzalez today. Actor, musician, father, he does it all. Rick, what's going on? How are you? Great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Alright Rick, let's wind it back. So, mm -hmm. growing up in New York, yes. tell me how you got started as an actor. Uh, plays, like school plays. So, uh, just, you know, kindergarten shows and, you know, doing those type of things. Um, I My dad had like this gigantic VCR camera and I'd run around with it and i remember just kind of telling mom, I want to do this for the rest of my life. And I was like pointing to the camera. And I was about five. <laughs> and uh, so that conversation progressed to like, the junior high school that I'm going to, is there an acting class in there? And she was like, no. And I'm like, well, can we find one? And so she would look around, you know, Bushwick, Brooklyn, where I'm from, and try to find a school that had acting class. So pretty much every step of the way, we just tried to find it. And that led to me going to LaGuardia and, and Manhattan, and uh, the rest is history from there. That's awesome. So tell me about growing up in Brooklyn. I mean, Brooklyn has really yeah. changed since yeah, you yeah. were there. So yeah, yeah, Bushwick yeah. then compared to Bushwick now, what do you think? Uh, it's uh, similar, just not no Lena Dunham in it, mm. you know. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, it, it just, it, it was like the thing at, as a kid, you know, you would see like a Foot Locker in Manhattan and then you go back home and we wouldn't have any chain right. stores or anything like that. So the moment that stuff started to happen, you saw the change in Brooklyn. Um, but yeah, I mean, growing up in, in, in New York and in Brooklyn, particularly Bushwick, was just a lot of culture. It was just rich with, you know, um, heavy, predominantly Puerto Rican, Dominican, uh, African-American people living in the neighborhood. And the music just rang out of every car. Mm. The, the culture of hip hop was so uh, alive and you know, palpable and, you know, just kind of fed the energy of the neighborhood and just made everything exciting and fun. And um, I miss those days of just kind of hearing, like, the cool, like, <laughs> you know, new song of the day or the uh, of the summer and just kind of rolling by a Cutlass Sierra or something. Mm. Just kind of resonated for me as in my childhood. Yeah, and different types of music as oh, you're going on each oh, block. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and one block is, you know, Hector Laveau and Mark <laughs> Anthony being played, and then the next block, it's, you know, KRS-One. Mm. So it's just, it's amazing. All right, so you're hanging out in Brooklyn, you're growing up, yeah. and then once you're in the city, like when you're a teenager, give yeah. me some fondest memories that you had, just hanging around the city, your yeah. favorite places to go, stuff like that. Uh, well, so we'd, we'd finished high school, finished the day for school, and we might have walked up to like 72nd Street or there's like a couple basketball courts mm -hmm. there. So if we had some money in our pocket, <laughs> you know, we'd stop off at McDonald's, nice. get some food, there and then go. we'd go play basketball for a few hours. And then uh, we'd say, okay, it's getting late. We have to head back home. Uh, just walking around, maybe sometimes we'd head to Soho and just kind of walk around, maybe get some food and, and, and walk into stores and say, I don't want to get that shirt or I want to get those jeans. Just kind of me and my friends just, you know, just hanging out, enjoying the city. Summertime in New York for me is always magical. Best, That's why yeah. coming back here in the summer is just the greatest. So uh, summertime for me always resonates in, in my childhood mm. heavily. I like it. So hoops, obviously a big part of your story. Yeah. Who were your guys growing up? Who were your teams that you just love to watch? Well, I, I was a huge Knicks fan, um, but I divorced the Knicks. Oh, you officially divorced I, the Knicks. I, I, I'm still on the train. I haven't officially. Well, divorced I, I divorced them. them, and but we still talk from time to time. Okay. It's, it's a it's a relationship that we. I still check in on them. <laughs> and, you know, see how they're doing. Um, and there may be a day where I, you know we might get married again. Mm. Who knows? You know. But right now, I divorced them in '94. Um, you know, oh, it's been a long divorce. It, it was a long divorce, and and uh, you Do know. Do you have that new special someone in your life? <clears throat> well, L Los Angeles is you know the Lakers have kind of taken my heart. Mm -hmm. You know they they found their way into my heart, and uh, so I I spend time with them a lot. <laughs> um, but you know, as a kid, you know, I, I mean, I could not be a fan of the Knicks. I mean, them going up against you know Michael Jordan mm -hmm. and the Bulls and. It, just, it was very tumultuous as a kid to see Reggie Miller score nine points in like can't even imagine yeah. seven seconds or something <laughs> ridiculous, and so that kind of scarred me and, and hurt me. So you know, but I, I, I do check in and I, I, every once in a while, every once in a while, I just kind of see like what's going on. So just know that I I still have a place in my heart. So Lakers have the heart now, but a little tiny piece. It's just, it's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about your career. So. Tell me those first moments when you're an actor, you're a working actor, and then you get that big jump. What was the first project, first movie that really set things over for you? I think for me it was uh, a film called The Rookie with Dennis Quaid. Yep, great it movie. Was a, it was yeah. a Disney film. 
Um, and it was kind of like my first foray into auditioning for a studio mm. film, you know, a film that was a big budget. Um, and I, I distinctly remember the director, John Lee Hancock, saying, you know what, Rick, I want to make sure that everyone remembers you in this film, you know, and it was like the dedication and the connection that the cast had in terms of making something special, you know, and fun, because I think we all kind of genuinely cared about the movie. We cared about, you know, the 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 real person who who, who we right, told true story. the true yeah. story about the, the the guy, and he was a really awesome guy, and and Dennis was so sweet, and I think as a, as a cast we just kind of like me and the guys, Jay Hernandez, Chad Lindbergh. And uh, Angelo Spazzeri, who mm. passed away, may he rest in peace. He, we just had such a great energy working on that film, and I think that kind of like gave me the launch pad to kind of move forward. So, what was the training like? How much baseball had you had in your life prior to that? Uh, well, I did play a lot of baseball as a kid. Um, I played a lot of little league. I played some in high school. Were you good? Uh, I was pretty decent. Yeah? I was pretty. You decent. could break I, a little bit. I was. I was pretty decent. I was. I was utility guy, so I was used for right field, second, second base. I. I was a bad catcher briefly in high school. A <laughs> little bit uh, of everything. A little bit of everything. So, um, yeah, I had the skill set. I had the skill set. So it definitely helped when I when I auditioned for the film because I remember one day we had to, uh, they took us out to a, f a baseball field and they just had all the actors kind of like hit the baseball, throw some pitches, you know, show their skill set basically. And I was like, I know I'm going to be the best one out of <laughs> all of them. And I knew that. They needed a pitcher, and I'm like, I can. I mean, I can't throw hard, mm. but my mechanics are better than anyone here. You so had the I skill. Got, you had the experience. I, I had the experience, so I, I knew it was a lock once I once I got to that level. So, so, so you mentioned working with Dennis Quaid. Yeah, so yeah. He's a sweet dude. Yeah. So you're you're a young guy in the industry yeah. at this point. What yeah. did you learn from him in terms of work ethic, coming to the set every day, you know, stuff like that? Yeah, um, I learned that you know it's about professionalism. You know, I think he set the tone for professionalism and, and what I saw in someone who we call the number one on mm -hmm. the set, you know, and, uh, you know, very kind, um, wasn't standoffish, was very welcoming, but at the same time was professional and uh, just had a sweet energy, you know, and I think that kind of let me know, you know, that energy kind of feeds everyone right. else, you know, it's a set very, the tone. It, it absolutely sets the tone and I think uh, what most people don't know about uh, film sets is, you know, the, the number one on the show or the film um, has that power to kind of, you know, shift the energy. Mm. And when that person is kind of toxic, it can change the energy of the show. It can hurt it or help it. And uh, so I've always been, you know, very uh, blessed to be around really good energy and just kind of see how that reverberates, you know. And so, yeah, it was great. So Dennis Quaid, obviously a big number one. Samuel L. Jackson, major number one oh, when it comes to the set. Oh, so major. let's talk Coach Carter. Absolutely. Coach uh, Carter, obviously a cult hit. Yeah. And you played Timo Cruz. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure you've talked about it a lot. But just reflecting on that experience, how cool was it for you to play that role, to work with Samuel L. Jackson, and to bring hoops back into your life a little bit? Yeah. I think it was, it, it was, uh, it was, I don't know. I just, I really was thankful to have that, that, that role and I knew immediately when I got it how important it was to play Timo mm -hmm. because I know so many guys like that right. and I know how misunderstood they are and even in Hollywood you know just I knew that that character was always misportrayed mm -hmm. or just not really shown in the correct light just with the energy and just with the you know what really ticks underneath you know and I wanted to bring someone that was emotionally um who was emotionally unstable, but still stable and and still had um, reasons for the mistakes and the, and the choices that he made. And so it was really important for me to just kind of honor this character and honor the the real guys that uh, we portrayed in the film. And, and if I'm not mistaken, I think Timo was a mixture of two real per people mm. on the basketball team, and they combined them uh, for the film. And it, it was just, for me, it just meant like, the kid from New York and also the kid from LA yep. who's misunderstood and how this coach was able to reach him and how some people aren't able, ever able to reach those kids, you know? But maybe we could get an insight into like, you know, the, the turmoil that they live with. So uh, it was profound, I mean, you know, and, and working with Sam was amazing because his energy was different than Dennis, mm. you know? His energy was more, um, uh, professional but at the same time he had the energy 
to to live in the set and to kind of like joke with us and to um, really uh, connect with us on a level that you know helped for our characters because we were you know teenage kids who were you know rambunctious and just had a lot of energy. He was able to feed into that and kind of keep that energy alive for the takes. Um, so. It, it was it was definitely uh, a lot of fun. All we did was crack jokes on each other. I bet. So uh, I think Channing Tatum got the worst of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, we had fun. I mean, it was just a lot of it was nothing but basketball all day. So our our uh, stunt coordinator slash basketball guru just kind of came on set, created a real high school environment for us to have drills. And then as as soon as we finished our basketball drills, we immediately went into basketball choreography for the for the for the shoot and uh we would just rehearse them all at once and um you know and w what was interesting was we wanted to make sure that each time you saw us play basketball you saw us perform that we weren't cutting away to the shot right. of the basket going in so we which happens so often absolutely Be and but only because you you're on a time, mm -hmm. you know, so you can't waste time, you know, at missing the shot. No, you can't miss eight in a row. And exactly. Just like, can we, can like, we hurry this up a little bit? <laughs> exactly. But we didn't waste time. No, you know, we, can't be doing we, that. We, we were making our shots. Definitely. There you go. You had the we, skills we back from New shots. York. So Cruz was a really complicated character, someone extremely talented, Yeah. Um, you know, confrontational at times, like you said, emotionally unstable. How did you prepare yourself for that role? And like yeah. you said, you knew some guys like that, but yeah. so many different layers to a character like yeah. that as the movie goes on. Yeah, um, well, I think it helped me to know, you know, a lot of those guys. So it, it, it informed me on like just the little nuances of like where their flashes of anger would show up and why it would show up. Um, getting to know Timo uh, and placing his ability on what he cared about the most, which was his cousin, who really represented his father figure because right. he didn't really have it in his right. life. And here comes Coach Carter who says, that's not really a father figure because at the end of the day, I wouldn't want you to throw your life away that way. So it was important for me to identify the mistakes that he's making in his life and kind of see how, um, how to really portray that in a real light in terms of what, why he's making those decisions. And so um, that was kind of like the, pre the preparation for me in terms of just locking that in. I think that the, the part that really helped me was knowing these guys, mm. growing up with them and, and seeing what made them tick and knowing it. It was already informed inside of me, so um, that really helped. Yeah, it wasn't foreign, which is really important. Absolutely, so, yeah. When you think about Coach Carter all these years later, lasting impact of the movie, you know, what do you think was the most profound impact of the movie, whether it's Sam's character as Coach yeah. Carter, whether it's the team coming together, the adversity off the court, what sticks out to you the most all these years later? I think for me um, is the characters we portrayed. I think that's what reverberated with people or connected with them because I've had countless people come up to me um, from different walks of life and say how uh, profound Timo was to them, uh, especially because he, um, he had this huge arc where he's on the team, leaves the team, yep. Um, loses his cousin and then decides to come back on the team only to realize that yeah you're right I, I need to I need to get to get to college yeah. and so that huge arc and him saying the Marianne Williamson speech um, kind of like inform this uh, full circle that he makes and I think that to me kind of encompasses like I feel like what really landed with people the most is seeing a kid who was lost and kind of saying I think I get it now you know I think I get that I don't really want to see myself succeed, you know? I, I think I'm comfortable in this space. Mm. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I've had so many people from all walks of life, people who left jail or, uh, you know, uh, people who are, you know, uh, real estate investors and stuff who would just say, you know, just that energy, just from opposite sp spectrums, just say that that really resonated with me. and. I'm just thankful for that. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, there was a relentlessness about his nature, and he just never gave up, no, no matter what was going on Absolutely. in basketball or in life. So Coach Carter hit on a number of different levels with people. Yeah. Old school hits in an entirely different yeah, way yeah. with people. Yeah, yeah. 15 years <laughs> since old school. Pretty crazy to think. Uh, it's, I mean, time flies. Don't make me feel old. <laughs> I'm gonna, not going to do, do that. that. So how did you initially get the interest in a movie like that? And then once you're on the set, did you realize this would be as freakishly crazy as you thought it would? Uh, I didn't realize it would be. Um, I think uh, Will had had already done Night at the Roxbury. Right. 
So that didn't really kick off the way old school did, mm. you know. So I think we all didn't really realize, you know, and the genius of Todd Phillips hadn't, we didn't know yet, mm. you know. That was his first foray. And then after that, obviously, he did the hangovers. Um, but I think we were all just kind of like, each day it progressed, like, Will was in such a magical zone. I mean, when is he not, right? I mean, <laughs> but at his purest in a movie like I, that. I mean, I tell you, I had a front row seat to, like, comedic timing and genius level of just improvisation. Mm. It was just, you know, it was, a, it was a complete, like, acting comedy class for me, you know? And I'd just sit there and just watch him take after take, find something new to bring to the scene, and... I'll admit that comedy was actually kind of my strong point, but then seeing what he did just kind of like informed another level mm -hmm. that I'm like, wow, I never really tapped into that. My comedy was always physical, but his he was able to find an awkward moment of timing in, in his comedy that I would just come up to him on set and just say, how do you do it? Like, where where is it? You know, and he's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> just do it. So... So the pledge scene is obviously yeah, yeah. one of the most memorable. You're yeah. part of that. How in the world did you film that? Ah oh, man, uh, we uh, which pledge scene are you? Do you mean? Well, the pledge scene with the brick. <laughs> 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 to put it bluntly, right there. <clears throat> so we're in UCLA. Mm -hmm. It's cold outside. I, I I would reckon it's like one a.m. Uh, we're drop trial, mm -hmm. and um, standing next, if, I forget who's next to me, but I think Joseph, who plays Blue, mm -hmm. is not too far from me on the thing, and. All I can remember that day was just how he was such a pro. <laughs> Meanwhile, we were all wussies just complaining <laughs> how cold it was and can you get us some hot chocolate and give me a coat. And and Joseph was just standing there just like, just hanging out. Let's do this. Just, let's do it. Let's shoot it. <laughs> and I'm like, can we get Joseph a coat? Can we get, your man's like, you know. The old man is freezing old over man's there. man's freezing. <laughs> he doesn't want to complain, so we're trying to stick up for him and, uh, yeah, we, you know, it, it's just, it was cool. It was just a lot of fun. Um, great energy as well. Um, I, I think what people think is that when we shoot that film, there's going to be like this gigantic party. Mm. It wasn't really much of a party, but we did actually get along really well. And it, it was mostly the pledges just kind of like hanging tight. You know, yep. it's just a bunch of us just kind of like hanging out. So it was, it was good. So I feel like this is also another movie that whether it's, you know, the 40-year-old real estate investor or the 25-year-old kid, both those guys can resonate yeah. with something like this. Absolutely. And so why do you think this movie was able to do that? Um, I mean, I think, you know, when we think of films like Animal House, mm. you know, uh, man, you know, I uh, can't remember the other film with Sean Penn in it, but it's just like really fun college films. and you Fast know, Times at Ridgemont Fast High. Fast Times yeah. at Ridgemont High, you know, just fun, you know, just ridiculous. Just over ridiculous, the top. fun, over the top, fun. I think people, you can't deny that. Mm. And I think when the chemistry between, you know, Luke Wilson and Vince Vaughn and Will Ferrell was so perfect, mm. you know, I think they just, Luke was such a perfect straight guy, you know, to have Vince Vaughn who can equally amazing in his improvisation of comedy because he would like just ramble an entire monologue of funny just off the head, you know. And then Will would just kind of say one awkward thing to interject. It was just perfect. And I think chemistry at the end of the day is what made that film so great. You know, obviously those outlandish things. I, would, I mean, Spanish, the character I play Spanish mm -hmm. was connected with this guy named Hatch, who was my buddy. We were like pot, these giant potheads. And, <laughs> and, and Todd Phillips had this idea of like, you know, having these guys go on adventures during the film of just like crazy pothead adventure stuff to like interject with all the stuff that the pledges were doing and that, you know, Will and, and the cast and the rest of the cast were trying to get into. But every day on set, a little bit of what Spanish and Hatch was mm -hmm. doing would go towards Will. So a lot of what you see Will doing you know, when he's like smoking pot downstairs in the basement and stuff like that was originally for Spanish and Hatch to kind of like, you know, find their find their footing. But I mean, how could you not give it to? You gotta give that, it to Will. That guy, <laughs> that guy was in a zone. Oh, no, it's one so of the all-time greats. Yeah. That's for sure. So you did a couple of these big movies, and I want to talk about Arrow because you've been doing that show the last couple of years. Yeah. You're into the superhero thing, which is huge right now. So, how has this experience been different from the movies, and what's it been like playing one character consistently? Uh, I, I think for me, it was, it's been exciting. I think um, 
Well, for me, I grew up uh, reading comic books. I grew up collecting Marvel. Uh, Wolverine and Punisher were my favorite. Um, so being a part of like a universe like this was like dream come true, you know. Uh, so and t I didn't know who Wild Dog was w when I got the part, but after doing the research and getting to know him, I realized I got even more excited because he did kind of feel similar to the Punisher and Wolverine. So I, in my own way, I'm, I was kind of like fulfilling that fantasy as a child to kind of play a, a badass, you know. So, um, I mean, it's been great. I, I think, you know, tackling uh, Rene Ramirez slash Wild Dog has been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's a lot of work in terms of like, you know, physicality mm -hmm. of it all and just kind of staying in, in shape to, to kind of make the character come alive. And uh, But I, I can't complain. It's just it's a lot of fun. And then how about battling Crohn's disease going throughout oh, all this? Yeah, How man. difficult was that? I mean, I have Crohn's disease. I was diagnosed at 17. Um, and I, I will say that um, I wasn't always um, uh, responsible in, in taking care of it, you know. And I think the older I got, the more I understood. The more I can take care of it, the more I'm able to, you know, really uh, work more and, and have less problems that can interject in the work that I do. Um, and... I realize, you know, and medicine has gotten better for it, and I've been able to kind of like manage it and control it. And uh, but it's it's a thing where you know you just kind of keep trucking along. And I've I've been very fortunate and blessed to have a mindset that I just never let it try to get me down. Mm. You know, I just do what I need to do to get right and and stay the course. So let's take a step away from your career for a sec. You rep Puerto Rico through and through. Yeah. Obviously, really difficult year for Puerto Rico. Yeah. So. Just thinking back to everything that's happened the last couple of months, what was the toughest part of the situation? And did you know people that were affected by this stuff? I mean, just take me through your mindset the last few months. Well, it's like sadness, really, you know, and just disappointment on so many levels in terms of um, seeing sadness because there's so many people suffering, you know, uh, and we there's so many people that can actually help, you know. In, in 2018, it's 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 possible that we can fix this and, and help them, you know, uh, in this time. Um, and so I, as all this was progressing and happening, uh, I just felt like sad and like mm. horrible that this is actually happening and there are people that are, and there's people today still don't have, you know, their homes are destroyed. No power. No power. Yeah. And um, it, it's not really progressing the way, you know, uh, it's really changed for like New Orleans or in, even Texas, you know, uh, and so things are taking a really long time for 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 things to get right with Puerto Rico, and that's where the disappointment comes in for me. And 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 sometimes I get angry because I'm like, how could we get to the bottom of it, you know? And it's I think it's a deeper issue than it just is us donating our money, you know. Uh, and so that conversation is where um, my mind is, mm. you know, and sort of understanding the logistics of how this can be solved on a government level, on a, you know, municipal level, you know. And so for me, that's that's where my mind gets zones out to and just trying to see what conversations can be had and what information needs to be given in, other, in order to understand how Puerto Rico can be. Uh, helped in this situation, how it can never happen again mm. as well, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 you know, back in September when it started to happen, it just, it hurt my heart. I have, I, I did, I didn't know, I didn't know I had family there at the time. Um, I, you know, I have uh, distant relatives mm. and stuff that, that uh, unbeknownst to me, I ended up finding out, but they were okay. I found out, and so I was able to connect with them and find out that they were good. So I'm glad. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's impossible to not be affected by it. And I'm glad to see that there were so many people that cared and and came together um, in terms of this situation and and did whatever possible. And even if it was just like a tweet or an Instagram post mm -hmm. to just kind of uh, uh, give people, you know, the the traction so they can see it. You know, I think that was important, and I was glad for that. Yeah, and it's not just a short-term thought. It's the long-term. And anytime there is a natural disaster or a tragedy, we're so focused on the things that we could do right yeah. now. But like you said, there's just much more to this equation. And I think it's awesome that you're thinking like that, and you're that type of person that can bridge the gap 
yeah. in terms of bringing government and people together. I think so. I think it's time. I think yeah. 2018, I think we've definitely seen the change and, and just how society now is so much more um, pressed on the issues and, and, care, and mm -hmm. cares about the issues, you know. Um, when I see someone like Emma Gonzalez talk, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm so, I get emotional when I see her talk because she represents the young people now who, who a lot of people before thought young people didn't care about, you know, the real issues or that didn't were happening. Or have the depth of thought. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I think she just kind of represents, like, no, you're wrong. Like, they do care, mm. and, they, and they can do a lot, yeah. you know. No question about yeah. it. No, it's been incredible to see the changes between student activists, people stepping up for Puerto Rico, the Me Too movement. I yeah. mean, there's been a lot of really great things that happened Absolutely. in the past year. So, Absolutely. Rick, before we get you out of here, you've done a lot of awesome things in yeah. your career. You were even Jesus in the Lady Gaga music <laughs> video. Can we just mention that for oh, a second? We can't let man. you get out of here without oh, that. Yeah. I mean, how did that happen? Oh, randomly. <laughs> um, I got a call, and uh, they said, yeah, uh, Gaga wants you to play Jesus in the, in the video. And I'm you like, think of like... Really? Okay. Are, which Gaga are we talking about here? And she's like, she wants you to, she wants you to kiss someone. She wants you to, you know, to, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna kiss Gaga, and it was like, no, <laughs> you, you're gonna kiss a guy, and I'm like, so I'm Jesus kissing a guy. Explain that, you know, and then they break down obviously, like, you know, with him, me kissing Judas, and I'm like, hmm, that'd be interesting. And then when I found out it was Norman Reedus, I was like, I, I love Walking Dead. Yeah, I love to work with him. So, yeah, it was great. Hey. Random part great. of the history. Why and not? that guy could really ride a motorcycle, obviously. Mm. I couldn't. I was, it was like, <laughs> can we have you ride on a motorcycle with Gaga? I'm like, I don't want to kill her. <laughs> I mean, I, I did Biker Boys, but that doesn't mean I can ride. No, nah, no. Nah. You know? Gaga wouldn't be feeling that <laughs> one, that's for sure. So, Rick, like I was saying, a lot of amazing things you've done in your career. What else would you still like to do? Oh, man. Hopefully, I, I'd like to produce and, and produce some of my own projects. So, we'll see. I mean, that's that's definitely in the pipeline. So, I have my ideas, and, and I feel like, for me, it's about identity, you know, and just, I think, uh, I'm 38 now, and I realize identity is the most powerful thing that we can use to express who we are and, and to society and to let people know just exactly what makes us tick and how we can connect to each other. And um, I think it's kind of dawned on me now, like, it's, it's, it's all about um, um, understanding your identity and who you are. And, and, and hopefully, and, and God willing, I'm able to, you know, have some projects and, and connect on that level. Beautifully said. He's Rick Gonzalez, yeah. DJ Sixman, saying so long. Thanks for joining us on The Sit Down.